The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 699 for Monday, March 5th, 2018. Ah, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We mix it all up and we make like salad. It's like salad. But the, the thing is, the extra ingredient, the dressing on the salad is answers to your questions, hopefully, and all sorts of other little delicious things like maybe a crouton here or there in the form of a quick tip that you didn't even know was coming. All that great stuff right there. And because it's salad, it's healthy and good for you, too. Sponsors for this episode include Smile, where at textexpander.com slash podcast, you get 20% off of your first uh, year's subscription to Text Expander. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And also, Barebone Software, the makers of the fine BB Edit, now tastier because it's 64-bit. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in fearful Connecticut, getting ready for yet another winter disaster. This is John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Now you saw we're go- we're going to get another one. I see, yeah, another I heard week. people talking about that. That's right. Yeah, I did. You get anything? Uh, have we spoken since the, there was some, something Friday or whatever that, that that you got? But we didn't yeah, really it was wind. right. Wind and rain. That's okay. So we got the same thing. Wind and rain. That's right. But actually, I I say that and it's true. We did get wind and rain here, but, you know, 10 miles away down on the coast, some like major massive flooding and also in Boston too, massive flooding. So, um, oh, same here. Our, our, um, no, I saw, you know, stamp a lot of coastal territories near me got got big flooding. Our, our town is actually put measures in place to make sure that doesn't happen. And, uh, it's actually lowered my flood insurance. Hey, rating, that's good. Which uh, is a good thing. Yeah. But um, and as far as salad, you know, salad's okay. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, man. <laughs> once you put the dressing on, it's not healthy. And uh, no, uh, folks, uh, a taco no. salad is definitely not. Uh, no, no, no. You can have healthy dressing, and we do. Oh, our dressing really? is healthy. Yeah, you just don't get the stuff with all the like, do, like make your own and and make it non-fat if you want even. It's all uh, good for you. I like blue cheese myself. Oh, see, I put oil and vinegar on. Olive oil. Uh, and now that's still got fat in it. Don't get me wrong. Oh, it's, sure. But, you know, it's olive oil. I figure that's that's good for you. I don't know. Let's talk about, like, Mac stuff, though. Um, yeah. Let's go to Eric here. And if I can pull up Eric's question, I will ask it. Do you have a trusted Mac app that securely deletes files after I make an encrypted image of my passwords I'd like to securely delete the source files. Um, yeah, so this is this is an interesting one, John, because um, I used to be able to in the Finder. I could option click the uh, the Finder menu and get uh, it to change from empty trash to secure empty trash. However, that doesn't exist anymore. And I think the reason it doesn't exist is because I'm running SSDs on all the Macs upon which I can test it. And I don't I think they, um, right? Because you can't secure delete on an SSD because the, the file system can't overwrite a file like that. It just like it, or it doesn't work that same way. Well, I think it's because the... With an SSD, you can't really predict where what memory cell is being used for a write operation. Correct. And probably Go for a read a write operation. operation. That's right. Yeah. Even when you so over where we talk a file, secure erase. Right. So what we mean by secure erase is that you basically and, and actually you can do this with a rotational drive, like with even with this utility, and it basically rolls through the drive and writes various patterns to every sector, which you can predictably do on a rotational drive, but you cannot do right on an SSD. However, there is, you know, I, I know we had this come up. The thing is some SSDs support the issuance. I think I got that right of a secure erase 
the whole thing command. Yes, um, that's right. But not all. So but, here, but through the finder, you can't, you cannot do it. Here's, but you also can't reliably recover anything from an SSD either. So, like, there's there's trade offs. Um, so I, I think the point is not only is secure erase not doable on an SSD in many cases, but I don't want to say all, it's also not necessarily as important as it was on a rotational driver as it is on a rotational drive. That said, really the way to do this is to use whole disk encryption, like, you know, file vault two and, yes. and then you're golden, I think. And then that, that's that. Uh, but you could use something like clean. My Mac uh, has a shredder functionality inside it. So you could do that if you, if you so desire, right? So again, I don't, I don't know if, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know if with an SSD that necessarily use whole disk encryption. That's, there you go. That's, I think, is, is the answer. Yeah. So unless somebody manages to guess your password. Um, right. Yes, your encryption key. That's right. Yeah. Your, your encryption key, then, um, yeah, that, that should do it for you. Cool. Right? Yeah, okay. I think so. All right. Uh, Finn asks, he says, I've got a Mac Mini from 2010, and I installed an SSD in it that I use uh, via home sharing to watch movies on my Apple TV. I noticed that after the SSD was installed, it now has a different name under Find My iPhone. It used to say, or maybe, I don't know if he means Find My iPhone, but uh, he says it, oh, yeah, 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 probably, that's probably true. It says it used to say Finn's Mac Mini, but now says Mac's MacBook. I went to the Genius Bar and they told me to reset my Apple TV, but this has not helped. I've tried reinstalling OSs, of course, and uh, have home sharing turned on everything else works i can airplay to the tv it did ask for a code for my mac or on my mac from the tv tried everything please help so i i think he's talking about um i i think he's talking about the home sharing name but maybe i'm missing something here it's hard to hard to understand well the home sharing name there are two places where you can set the name of your mac one is if you go to system preferences, sharing computer name, uh, and that will let you set the name of your computer there. And that's what should appear when you look for, you know, find my Mac and all that stuff. And then for home sharing, that's in a different spot. That's in iTunes preferences, general library name. And that's where you set what appears in home sharing for your iTunes library. And the nice part, the, the reason you would want to have a different name there is you could use two separate iTunes libraries. Here comes one of those croutons, right? When you launch iTunes, if you hold down the option key, uh, you'll get a dialogue that lets you select a different library or create a new one. And of course, um, then you would have two libraries and you might want to name them differently so that you know which one you're attaching to remotely or from another not remotely, but from a different computer on the same network. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at with it. What do you think, John? Uh, I don't like sharing, so <laughs> I don't share. I'm no. a terrible person. No. That's right. Well, it's, it's like your, your sister's more than four years older than you, right? Is that right? Uh, no. Oh, well, no, I was going to uh, say. Uh, 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 the Delta is two. Hmm. Okay. Well, I was going to, I was going to say, you know, the, the, there was something I was reading where they said that kids that are more than or four or more years apart, essentially grow up like, uh, no, not that much differently from an only child. So I was, was going to, I was going to give you an excuse for why you didn't like sharing, but uh, sorry, man, I don't have it. I got nothing. <laughs> uh, okay. Shall we move on to Simon then? Indeed. All right. Simon writes, find it. It's always there. Uh, Simon writes, how can I get both domains to show up when I am sending email from my iPhone with my Gmail account? Uh, I found that if I set up the account manually as an IMAP account, 
then I can add in the addresses. But if I just set it up as a Gmail account and choose the Gmail path, I cannot add additional addresses. And you're totally right. And he says, the problem is uh, this will only allow fetch emails when I set it up manually, whereas I can do push emails if I set it up using the Gmail preference in uh, the mail settings in iOS. And you're totally right um, all, about all of those things. And manual accounts can't be pushed. They can only be fetched. And that s accounts set up as Gmail in iOS mail cannot have multiple addresses attached to them, whereas manual accounts can. And again, for those of you that like croutons, if you go to um, settings mail on your iOS device, Oh, it's not settings mail anymore. God, I move this stuff around settings, accounts and passwords on your iOS device. And then you go to your mail account um, and you go into account again, only for accounts that are manual uh, set up like that on the email address. You can tap that and you'll see the option then to choose add another email. So this is in settings, um, accounts and passwords. Then you pick your account. And you go into the account and you tap on the email address and you can add a bunch here. And if your outgoing mail server supports it, you can send mail from all of those different addresses. Here's the frustrating part. If you go into Gmail's web interface, you can do the same thing. You can add accounts in the same way. I mean, you've got to configure them and prove that you own them and, you know, confirm and all that stuff. But you can have them there. Those don't translate over to the iOS mail app when you have it set up as Gmail and there's no way to add on the iPhone. But if you run the Gmail app, like if you go to the app store and download Gmail, that'll see all those addresses. So you could do it that way if you want to have it set up as Gmail, but then you got to use a different app. So there's like you, you don't get there's like three things and you get to pick your favorite two and that's it. Right. Yeah. And um, I saw a suggestion here in our chat room. Where is our chat room, Dave? MacKeekab.com slash stream. Yes. And we have a lively bunch in there almost every week. Right? No, they're, almost. they're always lively. They're always lively. <laughs> yeah. But the other suggestion is um, you may want to use a different email client. And uh, uh, Kiwi, Kiwi Graham says he uses Outlook. There you go. Yep. For his Gmail accounts, and uh, and I think I actually saw that our, our friend replied to us. And uh, is it, is it Spark? I think. Uh huh. I think that's another client. So, so the thing is, you may want to try another cli email client. But I don't think um, you'll get push notifications with anything other than Apple's built-in client. I mean, you'll get pseudo push, right? In that um, you can get a notification if the server supports it. But in mm -hmm. terms of like mail actually being pushed to your device, no, uh, the only way to do that is with okay. the mail app, I think. But somebody in the chat room will correct me if I'm wrong. Brian Monroe also there suggests that if this person is truly using the G Suite, which is the Google apps for business, uh, then you can use the exchange option to connect to that. And that will inside mail let you do uh, both of those things. So you could have that if in fact it's G suite. So there you go. Yeah. Fun. I don't know. It's crazy. It's always stuff, you know, that's eh, Google. I always breaking the rules or bending the rules. Just yeah. I don't know. Whatever they want, whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Jay has an interesting question, John. We're just pouring through these here today. That's good. Uh, he says, I know not when it began, but this must end. My built-in annoyance meter can monitor it no more. Every single time a volume, including a snapshot, is unmounted. Oh, I should say I should say that more accurately. And every single time a volume is unmounted, and that includes snapshots, Safari launches. Safari he says, not Safari technology preview, but Safari. Uh, and it doesn't load any page. It just comes up blank. I set up no automation anywhere. Why does Mac OS launch Safari, a browser I never use whenever a volume is unmounted? This peculiar behavior behavior has persisted since the initial batch of High Sierra public beta builds. The only thing about which I am certain is that this has gone on far too long and I am thoroughly annoyed, irritated and exasperated. Okay. Um, yeah, that's weird, man. 
it shouldn't happen, of course. Uh, it doesn't happen here. Probably doesn't happen for you, right, John? How would you even make that? I, I'm just trying to think how you even make that happen. Well, that's what I started to. thinking, right? Is if I wanted, <laughs> if I like, if that were desired behavior, how would I do it? And that's when I came up with launch services. Um, launch services can be done, can be used to do a lot of cool things, and it can trigger off of many, many things in the OS. And, and so it's possible that you've got something out there in launch services that is set, that has essentially told the system, anytime a disk is ejected, go and do this other action, which in your case results in launching Safari with a blank window. Um, the, the way to check that, the, the best way to check that is to use uh, a third-party app called Lingon, L-I-N-G-O-N. And Lingon will uh, will show you everything in launch services. And I'm hoping that on your system, you'll find something because other than that, I mean, I guess there could be a background app running, right? You know, you could have some menu bar extra or something running that, uh, that, that does that. I mean, I like that would be the other way, right? It's a process, but, but you could do it um, there. I, I don't know where else, John, right? A third party app could do that if it were running all the time, I think. I mean, I'm wondering if, I mean, we talked recently about um, uh, default apps. Um, <clears throat> it's a utility that shows you what extensions are mapped to certain actions. Okay. So that could get tedious trying to go through that and find out what is making this happen. Um, but there may be. Well, but it might not be an app. Them. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Is I mean, it could be, but I don't like what app would that? I don't think there's a URL called when a drive's ejected. Eh, well, me. I mean, WebDAV, maybe, kind of. You know, when a drive WebDAV is WebDAV is kind of a URL way to access drives yeah. and unaccess them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see where you're going with this. I'm, I'm kind of reaching. No, no, no. But, but okay. Right. Yeah. So checking to see what web dev is set to open with. I, yeah. All right. So web dev, for those who don't know, so web dev is a, a protocol where you can access a drive over HTTP. Right. right. Did I get that right? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. um, and, and you can access web dev drives with, a. a URL usually begins, I guess, with web dev. Does right? it, it? That's what I'm. That's what I'm checking here. Um, no, Safari can't open web dev drive dot local mm -hmm. because Mac OS doesn't recognize internet addresses starting with web dev. No, I think web dev is HTTP. I don't know, it's been. I don't use it often. Maybe enough. other browsers honor it, but just just reaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I I would uh, I would go with the um, I'd look in Lingon. Burn it, I, I would say burn it with fire. A Alex in the chat room <laughs> suggests starting up with the shift key held down to skip all of the third party apps from launching would rule out whether or not this is an app, and and so at least there would be that. I don't think it turns off uh, launch services. So. That would be one way of isolating. If it still happens that way, at least then you know, without driving yourself crazy, just in, uh, quitting right. everything, you'd because know whether it's an holding app Holding down shift is safe mode, which loads only Apple stuff and not third-party stuff. Right. So, right? So. Right. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or again, like I said, burn it with fire just to, you know, reformat and rip. Nah, you don't want to do that. Um, so it's a good question. I think it's a, it's a geek challenge because I've, I've never seen that. Behavior. So Alex also found a piece of software. This might turn into more of a, be more of a crouton than anything else. He found something, uh, called undock from flying paper software. And what undock does is, um, no, a simple critical piece to your Mac and eject all shortcut with superpowers. So maybe, I don't know. It's a cool thing, though, right? Uh, you can eject all your removable drives with one click. So it's like a, it's like a surprise. Cool stuff found is what that is. I don't, I don't think that's the that would be the cause of this. And Alex agrees, actually. But that's a pretty cool one. I like that. So we'll call that the bonus cool stuff found right there. I like it. 
Good. All right. All right. Hey, um, so you know what I want to do? I want to talk about both of our sponsors here, John. And then I want to talk about um, Chi because we have a lot to talk about with Chi, I think. Why do, do. why do they spell it? They spell it wrong. Well, they, they I mean, that's how it's been spelled for I, forever. I oh, okay. All right. Cool. It just, it just irks me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to talk about our sponsors here. Our first sponsor for, oh, yeah. Uh, our first sponsor for today is Smile, where at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, or actually textexpander.com slash podcast, you get 20% off your first year of Text Expander, which is a tool that I can't imagine not having on my Mac. In fact, as we were prepping the show today, uh, I invoked one of my text expander snippets. We have one that takes an Amazon URL and converts it into a Mac Geekab affiliate URL, which is what we use like in our show notes and stuff. And I invoked that. Nothing didn't work. I'm like, oh, that's right. I was doing something else before and I was quitting apps. And I wound up quitting Text Expander. So, of course, I relaunched Text Expander, but it hadn't been off for it had actually been off for a couple hours, but I hadn't used this computer in those couple hours. Like it like it took minutes of useful time for me to realize it wasn't running. And it, it's used for exactly that. Like you can you can do various things. Like I talk about how I have your address in there, John, so that when people ask to ship you something, I can just type comma J B A D D and boom, it fills out your address. I don't have to remember your address <laughs> That's or your anything for me. What's that? <laughs> That's your shortcut for me. That, well, mine for me is D H A D D for address. Not it has no, there's no diagnosis involved in this, John. Um, it's just J B A D D and boom, there's your address. <sighs> yeah. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought you were, uh, no, nope. yeah, well, not diagnosing. Uh, nope. Medical. That's right. Uh, but you can also do cool things like where I have a piece of an Amazon URL. I take the product ID and I put that on the clipboard and then I have a text expander snippet that builds the whole URL, putting that part from the clipboard in exactly the right spot. Right. So it can be really, really smart about these things. I highly recommend you check this out. It's one of my favorite utilities. So please do go to textexpander.com slash podcast. And that's where you can download it and get all set up and you get 20% off of your first year. So our thanks to the folks at text expander and smile for sponsoring this episode. Bare bones is our second sponsor and bare bones also makes a piece of software that I rarely don't have running on my Mac. And of course, uh, BB edit is what I'm talking about. And that is running on my Mac right now. I use it to manage all the text files for our show notes. I use it, of course, when I'm programming and need to edit some, uh, you know, some code, either PHP or JavaScript, but you can, I mean, just because I don't code in, in C doesn't mean you can't. And if you do, well, BB Edit will recognize that and format the text on the screen nicely for you. You can use it to count words in documents. You can use it, I do all the time, to compare two text files. Really handy. And you can invoke it from the terminal. Who doesn't like that? You go to the terminal, but, you know, you don't want to have to, like, edit in a, you know, nano window or an Emacs or, heaven forbid, a VI window. Although I prefer VI to Emacs, actually. <laughs> hey, hey, careful, careful. I like careful. VI. I, you know, my, my fingers know how to do it, but I, I don't like to do it. So, uh, but I type BB edit and edit there. And now I get to use my mouse and be, you know, like civilized. I don't have to be fighting in the command line or whatever. So it's really awesome. You got to check it out. Go to barebones.com. Check out BB edit. I mentioned it last time and I'm going to mention it this time. Now, with version 12.1, 64 bits of goodness. Yes, that's right. BB Edit is ready for the future. That app, I think, is more than twice as old as this podcast, if that's telling you something. And now, up to date, 64 bits, ready for the future. Our thanks to the folks at Barebones at barebones.com for sponsoring this episode and for making BB Edit, really, for everything. Thanks, folks. All right, now it's time for some chi love, John. So chi spelled Q I Q I, which is what we uh, also that call. That just irks me. Yeah, we call it wireless charging. I, I really we should be calling it contactless charging, right? Well, because inductive, 
inductive charge. Okay, okay there you go. Yeah. Uh, the most accurate term. It, it, it's magic, but it's a electromagnetic mm-hmm. magic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the thing that allows Leave you to take that. your iPhone 8 or 8 Plus or iPhone 10 and put it on some sort of magic pad that then just starts charging. You don't have to plug it in. It's beautiful. If you have one of these, um, Apple doesn't include a cheap pad in the box, but uh, but you can go and get one. And they're relatively inexpensive. You can get them for like about 10 bucks. John and I, we've been through a few of these things, and I wanted to kind of go through it because one of the most important places that I can think of to charge your Qi devices or your iPhone is right next to your bed. And it's super convenient if you don't have to fool with plugging in a cord every time. But what's worse is when you've got a bright blue light shining in your eye, trying to sear your retina through your eyelid throughout the night just because your phone is charging next to the bed. So we started looking at these things and we found some that work next to the bed very well. And we found some that don't. Um, So I'm going to start with one that doesn't. Uh, The first one that I got is the PowerBot Chi Puck that has very bright LEDs. It's green when it's not doing anything and it's blue when it's charging and it's 10 bucks on Amazon. I use it at my desk and I love it. It's great, but wow, it's way too bright next to the bed. So I, uh, I, I, I say no bedtime for the PowerBot Chi puck, but it's 10 bucks. So, you know, cool. Yeah. Right, John? Good? Good. Okay. No, I don't like, uh, it, and you know, I got to shake, uh, I, I have to say I shake my fist at any vendor that makes a product that has blindingly bright blue LEDs. Yeah. I don't know why some feel it's necessary, or at least give me an option to turn it off or dim it or, or something. You know? Any LED is, is that's lit all the time is too bright, if you ask me. Um, yes, as Brian Monroe in the chat room says, you can put black tape over, you know, electrical <laughs> tape or whatever <laughs> over the yes. light. But I'd actually like to have some indication as to what's going on, because the, the puck will tell you, If there's a problem, like it'll, this one, I think turns red if, or it flashes even if there's an issue and you need to remove the phone and let it reset and then try again. So I'd like to see the light. I just don't want it on all the time. The one that I'd had, that I had been using for a little while is the monoprice Chi uh, adapter or puck rather. I also, uh, I think it sits right at 10 bucks. It was when I last looked, that one's pretty good. It's, it's red when it's not charging. And it's blue when it is, but the light's way dimmer than the PowerBot one. So this, I I just turned the light away from my bed so it's not aiming at me, and it's fine. Uh, it's still there, but and it certainly lights up my bedside table enough that I could like fumble around to find chapstick or whatever. But um, but it's it doesn't keep me awake. So if you want a puck style thing with no light or not no light but lower light, the Monoprice one. Uh, works. What you have one, you have a puck, right? That you use, John. Yes. So I got one. It, it's almost sacrilege, but, um, I think I got it through, um, thrifter, which is a okay. site that we mentioned in the past that, that, um, lists deals. And, um, and although it retails for $40, so it's a Samsung charger, okay. yep. uh, which is why I say it's kind of sacrilege using it. You know, Samsung oh, I makes see. Android phones to charge an iPhone. Sure. Um, but they had a thing and they're like, yeah, it's uh, 15 bucks. Oddly enough, that then they redirect you to Amazon or in my case, they did. Yeah. And it's funny because the black one was 15 bucks and the white one was 40 bucks. And I'm like, huh? But okay, whatever. But I like this one um, because the LED is subdued and then it has a blue LED. So the thing is, there's no LED when it's just sitting there. So they give you a USB, uh, USB. I, th- I think it's a you know two amp or something. So sure. so you have it comes with its own USB uh, wall wart. Okay. And then you plug it in, but the thing is, the light is not on unless there's something on it charging. And when it is, it's a very subtle blue LED. The weird thing is that they they say in the documentation, which is very sparse that the LED should turn from blue to green when the phone is fully charged. And at least in the case of my iPhone 8, 
I never saw it do that. It just but the thing off. is, it's fine, yeah. and it's also a and I used a iStat Mini to measure this. So iStat Mini can actually tell you the power from this. So this thing provides six watts of power, which is not fast charging, but it's you know, I mean, it gets the job done. Sure, it, it will eventually charge it. So I'm very happy with it, and uh, the deals are kind of in flux with this thing because um, I've I've seen to mention another thing that. Somebody told us about honey. Um, wait, wait, slow down, slow down, slow down. Let's just stay on the chi topic here. I don't want to go right, too well, far down that path. Well, we're on the chi topic. Yeah. Um, okay. But no, so, it's a, I'm happy with it. I got two of them, 15 bucks. It, it offers six watts of power and, uh, and there you go. And it, and it doesn't blind you. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. The iPhone will not do the full, what, 10 watts of fast charging, but it will do, um, up to seven and a half watts of charging if the uh, if the puck supports it so yeah um the third th or the yeah the third thing that i've tried uh in the bedroom next to the bed is the one that i'm now using and it's the ventev wireless charge stand this thing's pretty cool because it's got like the the typical little puck uh in it but the puck is movable inside the stand so you can set it at the height that makes sense and you can either have your phone in uh, portrait mode or landscape mode you just kind of lean it up on this stand and it just starts charging when you lean it up on the stand because you're leaning it up against the puck but you can adjust the angle of the stand by kind of flipping the stand around or uh, you can you know and or you can adjust the the orientation of your phone on the thing so that's what i've been using now uh, it is a 15 watt charger. Of course, it'll only charge the iPhone at seven and a half. But what I really like is that when I put my phone on it, it flashes blue for a little while to tell me, hey, you're in good shape. We're charging. And it's a dim blue light at that. And then it goes out. No light on persistently at all. And that to me is the best because that way I'm not adding any more light to the bedroom. It's just right there. And the phone's up on a thing. So I'm not fumbling around. It's not sliding all over the place. So that's, that's my current one. That one, uh, if you go to Amazon, you can get it. It's not, uh, it's of course it's not 10 bucks. It's 60 bucks. And, um, but it's got a little more to it. So, you know, and it charges faster and all that good stuff. So there you go. That's my, uh, that's the one I'm using on the bed. I'm I'm traveling though, John, and uh, and so I've been thinking. Okay, what am I going to use? Because you know, like, what am I going to use? Well, I could plug my phone in, you know, like a caveman, John, while I'm traveling. But that <laughs> that doesn't sound so good. No, I checked out this thing. It's from a company called Bezalel, B E Z A L E L, and they actually make quite a few things. But the one that I'm talking about here is their Prelude, which is a portable wireless puck. It has a battery in it. It's, you know, a little thicker than your typical cheap puck, but it's got a battery in it so that you can charge this up and you can charge your phone anytime you want. It's a 7,000 milliamp hour battery. So if you don't have a convenient place on the nightstand at, uh, in the hotel room uh, to plug in, no problem. Charge the puck up during the day, bring it over to the nightstand, you put your phone on it, you're good to go. Your phone's right there. It's charging wirelessly. Everybody's happy. And you don't need to plug in. It's truly wireless charging, right? It's just right there from the battery. So um, so that's, you know, and they, they, uh, they'll they get 60 bucks for that too. But I think that's a pretty cool thing. So I'm looking forward to that with my, uh, with my trip to South by Southwest next week. So... That's what I got there, John. I do have a couple other things, but it sounded like you had something to add. No. no okay. South by Southwest, man. Hope you get some uh I hear they have good barbecue in Texas. That's the plan. So while we're on the while we're on the chi thing, um, one more because th to me this is the place where chi works really well. Uh I've been a big fan of the the uh, mounts in the car that a plug into the now unused CD um, you know, port, whatever, you know, it just does a pressure mount in there. But the ones I really like uh, are the ones where you put your phone in and there's a little trigger that trips the, uh, like some, some clamps that come down and hold your phone. So you can just pop your phone right onto the charger with one hand and, or onto the mount with one hand. 
Now, previously, I would have to plug in, but IOTTIE, I-O-T-T-I-E, makes a one-touch four dashboard and windshield car mount, and, uh, and it's got a Qi pad right in it. So, it, yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. And it works great. I've got it in the car. You just plug it in and you're good to go. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's 50 bucks for the uh, for the, the one with the Chi in it. It comes with a suction mount that you can put on your dash or whatever. But IOTI has a whole line of products. And so you can, they're sort of modular. So you can take the, the suction mount off and put a CD mount on. And that's what I've got in the car now. And now I just get in the car and pop it up. And it just automatically starts charging. So it's pretty good, I nice. think. Yeah, you know why not? And when I and when I posted the uh, the stats of uh, that I measured, actually one of my friends, uh, my pal Scott out in uh, Arizona, yeah. said, "Oh yeah, my car actually has a Qi charger." I guess really that's the, the latest thing. Apparently, some newer vehicles, which is not me, <laughs> right, <laughs> have that built in along with you know all the other high tech toys like Bluetooth and CarPlay and wow. all that stuff. So. Wow. That's pretty neat. So That's something to look good. for in your next vehicle if you want to charge your phone while you're uh, yeah. on the road. Yeah. Well, it's nice that this is a, a standard. Like you said, you bought, you know, a Samsung Qi pad and we're talking, I mean, we didn't mention one Apple device here uh, and they all just work because it's a standard, which is, you know, great. Thank you, Apple, for doing that. It's pretty good because the watch, I'm, I, I remember when the watch came out, like somebody dug into it. And said, yeah, it's Qi, but not really. Not in a way that you could put it on a Qi pad. It needs like the magnets and whatever. So, I don't know. It's crazy. What do you think, John? Anything else? Do we have anything else to say on the whole Qi thing? Or are we uh, time to move on? I'm, hey, I'm a fan, you know? I mean, Same. I, you know, yeah. decided to upgrade, you know, my phone, even though I didn't have to, but I could. And uh, and that's one of the benefits of the eight or the ten, or the X ten X. Which is yeah, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. It's the ten. Yeah, but yeah, it's cool. It's um, I like the wireless charging. It's a, and if you've got an eight or an eight plus or a ten, and you haven't done this yet, really, it you know ten bucks. It's pretty cool to be able to uh, just pop your phone down and have it off and running. So check it out. All right, John, uh, before we move too far along, I want to say a big thank you to all of our Mac Geekab Premium subscribers. So thank you to all of you. If you want to learn more about Premium and you're not already a Premium subscriber, go to MacGeekab.com slash Premium or even just MacGeekab.com. There's a link right there, obviously. You can, get, you can learn about it. It's really for those of you that can and want to support us directly. Uh, and so we've got it all set up. You do get access to a very special uh, premium at MacKeekab.com email address where we prioritize those questions that come in and we try to help you out as much as we can. So uh, it's our way of saying thank you back. This week we had uh, on the biannual $25 every six month plan. We had Nick S, Martin B, Peter M, Jonathan C, Seth R, Bartek B, Eric WB, Gene R, Sandpiper, Bruce W, Randall S, Rob H, Daniel C, Jeff S, Douglas S, Bob P, and Matt C. And in the monthly $10 plan, we have Chris F, The B Man, Michael L, Bob P, Jason A, Olga P, Greg S, Ward J, Petter H, Jim E, Elizabeth B, David M, and John B, and then also on the monthly plan, but at 15, Micah P. So thank you to all of you. Uh, really, it's, uh, it's awesome. And it inspires us to really keep doing what we're doing here, and we appreciate it. So thanks. Shall we go on to a, uh, a question, a last-minute entry to the agenda, John? Whoa. All right. All right. Uh, yes. pre, just pre-show, network guy in the chat room asked, uh, if money were no object, what is the fastest wireless router? And it's actually kind of interesting because uh, we've been talking. We've been talking about this, I, the, the three of us, but also with uh, Allison Sheridan is the the third party here because she started doing some testing and asking 
some really good questions. And she put an article up, we'll actually link to it, uh, where she tested uh, two Netgear routers. She tested the Orbi mesh and the Nighthawk X8. And as she was testing them, she shot me an email and said, why am I seeing much faster speeds, you know, from the, the X8, the standalone router, the, in, as opposed to the Orbi, which is mesh, isn't mesh supposed to be faster? And mm. right. And the answer is, well, you know, it depends because the X8, if you want a fast router, truly where speed is the most important thing. A four by four wireless router, which means it has four streams in each direction on each radio is going to be the fastest, even though most of your Apple devices only support two by two, a four by four router can tune the best two streams towards you as opposed to just it's only two streams if it's just a two by two router. And Allison was seeing like double speeds. She saw what 338 megabits per second on a on the the night gear the Nighthawk X8 and it was like 170 something uh on the Orbi. Now and 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 so there to answer your question the, the Nighthawk X8 is most definitely a router to consider. It's one of my favorites. Um it's from Netgear. Uh, it's a four by four router. It's actually got three radios in it. It's got two five gigahertz and one uh, two point four gigahertz, and every single one of them is a um, is a, a four by four radio. So you've got all those streams, which is great. Um, I okay. really so you got the streams, and then you got the frequency, and then I guess you got the negotiated. Uh, what the heck? The, I just want to help people understand the, the, the multiple factors here. So mm -hmm. one is the number of streams. So more is better, of course. But then the, the frequency that's selected is another aspect of this. And then the speed that is negotiated between the client and the router is the third part of it. And if everything, if all the gears mesh, then you get these wonderful speeds. That's true. Um, that's right. But but even when the gears don't all mesh, and no pun intended with the, using that word, a four by four router in all the tests that I have done winds up serving any client faster than a two by two router in the same spot. And that's, again, just because those extra streams can can be used to tune and select the best one for that client device. And it really does make a difference. The Synology uh, RT2600 AC, which is just a two band, it's just got one five gigahertz and one 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, that one also way faster than any of the two by two radios that are out there, just because it's, you know, it's got those extra streams. So a four by four by four routers with the extra streams are, are, are far and away going to, going to be faster all else being equal, but it's worth noting that mesh might make things faster if you're having coverage issues, right? Mesh is out there to solve coverage issues and congestion issues, right? Because you've got multiple radios all over the place, so cl different clients can connect and you're not tying up just one radio or one set of radios on a router. So uh, depending on the shape of your house, uh, if one router serves everywhere in your house, then you might be better off with one of these standalone four by four routers like we've just discussed. If you have sort of a sprawling house or things are spread out or you have, uh, you know, maybe air conditioner ducts or a refrigerator in the wrong space, wrong place or whatever, something blocking radio waves, then mesh can really be your friend because it can help you kind of, you know, navigate around that by sort of, you know, relaying the radio waves as it were. So there you go. That's my thought, right? It's coverage versus speed. And you got to decide what the, um, what the right thing is for you. The really nice part about mesh is if you have a problem, you just go and put another mesh point in and you can begin <laughs> to solve those problems. Um, whereas, you know, if you, if you just have a standalone router now, maybe you're trying to move things around and, and all that stuff. And, you know, even though Allison tested and found that 
you know, we're talking about 338 meg- megabits a second in her house versus 170 in her house. 170 is still pretty fast. Like it, Netflix isn't going to be any different for you on either of those connections. No, well, Netflix, even at the highest definition, I think is less than 10 megabits a second, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you don't need a lot of pipe to, to do even HD video. So, uh, right. Right. So it, it depends. I mean, if you're really pumping like lots of data around, maybe you have a, a you know, you're, you're editing video or like something like that, then, then you're downloading. Yeah. Or, you know, pirating, you know, movies and stuff. like. That. Yeah. But even then, <laughs> like how fast and you, want, and you yeah. want the maximum bandwidth so you don't maximum. get caught. Right. Right. Yeah. Good luck with that. Uh, use a VPN so you don't get caught folks. There's your, there's your crouton for that. Um, yeah. Otherwise your cable company you really will like catch croutons, you. Don't you? Wow. I don't well, know that. Like I'm going to, I'm going to buy you some croutons. It's just extra. <laughs> um, Brian Monroe asked in the chat room, what's the fastest mesh? He said, isn't the Orby the fastest mesh? And it, this is a little bit, uh, there's a, there's some points of confusion here. The Orbi, when it talks to clients, is always two by two radios. For its backhaul, the high end Orbi has a four by four radio that it talks, um, that it does all its backhaul with. And that's a separate radio from the two that talk to clients. So it can be faster. But in terms of that raw speed to the client, no, it's not, especially when you're, but- you're talking right from the router or from the main unit. Right, but then you mentioned that the uh, uh, so the, the the mesh products that support wired backhaul, uh, I think, have the potential to offer you better overall performance, and I think the Orbi is one that does support that. Right, it does now, as of November. Yeah, it didn't originally. Oh, all right. Yep. Yeah, if you can do yeah. wired backhaul, but again, you're still limited to those two by two radios on the front hall side. Right. Right. But um, Ubiquity's Amplify HD is has three by three radios in it so th- i think that's the fastest consumer mesh right now because all the eros are all two by two the orbies are two by two to the clients the amplify is three by three so um again, but again Aero, it all depends on your layout Aero change that what's that so i ha- I, I have Aero gen one Did, didn't the gen two uh add something it added a radio but it did not. A radio. It didn't but add not a stream. Correct. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have that right. Right. Euro Gen Two. I'm ninety nine point six percent certain about that. Yeah, it's two by two radios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I mean, with a twelve hundred square foot two story house here, um, Euro be, Gen be, One is. I'm. I'm. I'm just fine. Yeah, you'd be fine with anything we mentioned already. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right. Good. Good, good. Shall we go on to Bill, John? Where are we here? You going to take us is, to Bill? Is Bill mine? Oh, yes. This uh, Bill can... Uh, the, this one gets kind of interesting, so let me, uh, let me bring it up here. Yeah, we kind of went all over the place here, but um, here's what Bill says, and this may be a, a this may be a geek challenge, Dave. I don't know if you read over this, but uh, so Bill says I've run across some weird Mac OS 10.13.3 behavior that seems to involve the Finder crashing. I'm having trouble pinning down the cause, however. Some of the symptoms: keyboard maestro can't open Finder windows and macros or log windows from menus. BB edit. Uh oh. Won't close, apparently because it can't read or write a certain file and it won't display lines that contain certain characters, such as a check mark, then display that display fine in text edit. Uh, another symptom, carbon copy cloner and backblaze don't run scheduled backups. Another one, I get up in the AM to find the computer has shut down, perhaps when carbon copy cloner or backblaze tried to run the night before. And Finder windows won't open from the dock. In the first and last case, restarting the Finder usually fixes the problem for a while, and I suspect that the other symptoms may relate back to the Finder and or file system. Perhaps Carbon Copy, Cloner, or Backblaze can't open files, therefore they don't run. Here's what I've done to try to fix it. Run Onyx, and I assume cleaning things up. Run Disutility. 
reboot in safe mode and restart, reinstall OS from recovery, and erase disk and do a clean reinstall. You'd think the last step would fix it if it were a software problem. It seems to be. But if it's hardware, why is it intermittent? Any help would be appreciated. And yeah, I I was scratching my head over this, Dave, and, uh, you know, a little bleeding. No, this is a... First off, I reflected upon something that's important to me because it's me. But um, I was having Finder issues on my MacBook Pro recently, uh, running 10.13.3, and it would, repeatedly, it would repeatedly crash and put up a dialog box saying it crashed, and would I like to reopen the Windows... And then it would recycle in that. So I, I've seen this Finder thing as well. I don't know if you have, Dave. Uh-uh. Where the Finder... Uh, okay. But but I've seen it uh, maybe once a month, where the and, Finder just gets totally confused. And does and restart, restarting the Finder solve the problem? No. No. Uh, oh, you have to reboot even the Mac. logging out and logging in you'd think that would solve the problem, but I found in, the, in this case, the, a restart is necessary in order okay. to fix the problem. Because for him, restarting the finder fixes it, at least for a while. Yeah. Um, but I do agree that erasing and reinstalling should fix any issue, and I think that's where he left it. It's and true. He did that, and it seems to have gone away. But before taking that step, I would have suggested that he runs... He, he I suspect maybe data corruption well he didn't drive. he says yeah he says erase disk and do a clean and reinstall didn't do it right he says you'd think that last step would fix it if it were the software problem it seems to be but if it's hardware why is it intermittent it wasn't clear to me if he took that step and oh i it see kept happening uh, I, i'm not clear on that he says he did that yeah and then he was saying yeah it's true i'm with you on that yep all right yeah and then he asks about the nature of hardware problems and well, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're but, um, intermittent. To continue, yeah. but to continue, I suspect what happened is that I think he may have had data corruption because the, the number of things that he mentioned that were not working right would suggest to me that it, it was data corruption. Yeah. So before he did the reformat and all that, the, the one thing he did not do was run a utility, even something basic like disutility or drive genius to see if there's any data corruption or running something that can report the smart parameters, which I know we agree that, you know, smart is not perfect, but tools such as drive DX um, can do some, what I'll call predictive failure analysis. They're like, yeah, you know, I see these numbers are increasing and that that's not good. So, um, yeah, well, this is this would be an SSD, right? More, well, the thing is, yeah. So, so actually, not. yeah, the full the full dialogue is is not in the box here. My apologies, but he did get back to me, and he did say. So this is what makes it even weirder. He's like, yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I did run. So he does have Drive Genius and Drive DX. Um, so that was in a follow up, which uh, again, I'm just, I, I didn't put that in our box. No problem. I'll explain it to you. Um, so he did run Drive DX. It, it thought so. It's an SSD. It's in a newer iMac, um, and he ran Drive DX. And here's the weird part, though. This is where it goes off the rails, my friend. <laughs> he ran Drive Genius, and it gave the same error that I got with Drive Genius oh. with my rotational APFS drives. So this is where it goes again. I'm going to say off the rails. Is it when he tried to run Drive Genius on that same drive, it reported, I think, this error 72, which turns out to be an I.O. error, which is pretty much useless. I mean, it's like, well. <sighs> yeah, but so, I.O. error could mean that there's a that there is a hardware problem with that drive. And that was that was my response to him is that I think it sounds like it is an issue with either your SSD or the connection to the SSD and maybe the uh, controller or the controller in his machine. So yeah. I think the next step he said is that he's going to do Apple Care or um, Genius Bar to determine that. But, but I'm really, you know, after hearing all of the stuff that he said here, I'm really leaning towards a hardware issue. 
versus it could data be. corruption. Yeah, I you know I would wipe the drive and start. I mean, if he he says he's done. I mean, the he did that test. already though. Yeah. Well, he did that already, and it sounds like the problems have. Yeah, it, well, that's other right. Other than Drive right. Genius saying, "Oh yeah, yeah I had this hard, weird it's, error." It's the hard drive. Yeah, if he's erased it, I mean that's the test, right? If it's if it's file system corruption, wiping the disk and doing a clean reinstall is going to address that. So yeah, it it's a problem with the SSD, yeah, or like you said, the controller or the cable, any of those things. Yeah, um, right, a- Alex. So I'm hope Alex in the mm-hmm. chat room had an interesting thought, uh, kind of as we were going through this, and and it's worth throwing out there not necessarily for this problem but as other people are going through different things alex says you know when he said that it wouldn't display lines containing certain characters um that display fine in text edit he's like well they both use different fonts right bb edit uses one set of fonts text edit uses another and it's entirely possible that those fonts have gotten corrupted so checking those fonts and uh, going into font book and, and, and looking or having it do a, a, you know, a check of all the fonts, uh, that would be not be a bad thing. Um, and if, he, you know, and, and Alex actually points out that it could still be that if he restored from a time machine backup, because if there was a corrupted font file, well, then that's, you know, that would come back. So it, it, it yeah. you know, font, font it's book, just- it's worth remembering. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I've I've used it in the past, and yeah, sometimes you know I find duplicate fonts, which could cause problems. And, yep. Uh, well, and you can just use things. it to validate fonts, so it you know it'll go right. through and and but if you're really having a problem, first make a backup of all your fonts, and then just restore the standard fonts in the file menu in FontBook. That'll get you back to ground zero. I mean, you'll you'll miss all yeah. of your your great stuff, but it'll rule that out. And I and I've seen it. You know, I've seen fonts like totally crater a system. So there you go. Yeah. It's just with the variety of symptoms and apps that were misbehaving. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I just couldn't detect a common thread other than your data is messed up. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, fonts are a common thread. That's the thing is, you know, they are ah. right. I mean, they're system wide. So I, I, I like, I, I'm not necessarily sure that that's the solution here. Although it might be, but I, I like, you know, it's, that's a good one to throw out there and just remember as you're troubleshooting these things that fonts are uh, system wide, you know, and I've seen them like crater a system. Uh, yeah. So. Ah, uh, you're right. And the thing is, yes, you can actually. Yeah. So I'm looking right now. I haven't run it a while, but yeah, you can go into font book and highlight your uh, fonts and then say, I think validate file value. We'll go through them and, and yep. say, um, Yeah. You know, they're good or bad or, or, or again, duplicates, I think, is, is something that I've seen wreak mm-hmm. havoc. Mm-hmm. You have multiple installations of a font, and yep. uh, sometimes that confuses the OS. So, Hey, um, All right. I, I wanted to, to mention, we were, um, I was talking uh, last show, I guess it was, about that, that client that had, um, where I, I had both the husband and wife using their... Um, the the same iCloud account because the goal was to share photos. Well, two things about that. Number one, listener David wrote in and suggested leaving them with separate iCloud accounts and using Google Photos to sync both of their libraries to Google Photos. And he, he's totally right about that. In fact, I had had that conversation with them. The problem with Google Photos, of course, is they don't show up in your photos library in the right way, you have to do all this syncing and everything. And while, yes, you could look in Google Photos to, in the app to see everything, they wanted it all in one place. So we got them there. There was one caveat, though, when you are sharing an iPhone or an iCloud account, and that is that phone calls will ring on other, the other person's computer unless you go in and turn that off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that I knew I was missing something, but if, yeah, if you go in to uh, settings phone and go to calls on other devices, that's where I had to go to manage where this would happen and not happen. So hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So, 
And Brian Monroe is saying, use iCloud, read the terms and conditions. So I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that. Maybe maybe you'll explain <clears throat> what you mean by, I, I'm assuming you mean Google's terms and conditions. But um, but the, uh, go ahead, John, because I have one thing. I, I merged all their photos and I want to talk a little bit about that. But Oh, but, okay. okay. No, I was just tossing out Flickr as a oh, yeah. solution since uh, last I checked, uh, Mac OS and iOS do have some level of uh, Flickr. Integration. Yes, so, it's true. Yeah. Checking them out. You got to pay for it, but yeah. Eh, well, I'm on the I'm on the cheapskate plan, and uh, I'm happy. But yeah, you can get the pro. Right? Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. Brian's saying to use a uh, a shared album. That's how you do this. Well, you can, but things aren't automatically put into the shared album, which is what they want. They really wanted to have one photo library, and I get that. Like. Having a family photo library, everything is all in one place. So they had had someone else uh, work on this machine and or work on this problem for them. And so they gave me this, this, they had this drive that had, once I started, I, I started looking at it at their house and I said, wait a minute, we're going to need, like, there's going to be a lot of uh, unsupervised time while these libraries all merge together. So I'm going to go ahead and take this drive home to my office. So I don't have to sit here and bill you for, you know, the hours and hours and hours while these things merge. And, uh, and so I did, there were no less than seven, uh, iPhoto and or photos libraries on this drive. So there were about half of them were iPhoto libraries, half were photos libraries. There were a lot of dupes, but no one, thing that duplicated everything. And then there were two folders, each with, you know, a hundred gigs of data of loose photos in them. And I had no idea how any of this came together, but power photos, man, was like saved the day and saved them a bunch of money because power photos will merge and it'll merge multiple libraries into one and it'll check for duplicates on the fly. Uh, really, really awesome stuff. So I set up a separate user account. You're going to love this, John. I set up a separate user account on my Mac, started doing all this for them there. And I logged that user account into their iCloud account just for photos. I turned everything else off. And that way, once I finished merging, I merged everything together into a separate library that wasn't their photo, their iCloud photo library, but I did have my computer download all their photos so that I could do the, the final merge here as well. And so I, I got it all together. I cleaned up this one library that was like merging everything that was on this disk that they gave me. And then the final step was I merged that into their iCloud library. And the best part is now that's on their computers and I haven't even gone and given them their driver or actually I haven't even given them a bill. Like the problem is solved. And because of iCloud, they just magically get the solution pushed to all their devices. Huh. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty good. So, you know. But uh, Power Photos, man, that was the uh, the saving grace. Really, really great piece of software. It's totally was stable through the whole thing. I mean, this thing ran for probably four days straight on my iMac in the office, just kind of, you know, doing various different crunching really? and all that stuff. Oh, I mean, well, I, I had to constantly, you know, it, it took like five minutes here, 10 minutes there of my time to go over and like, okay, it finished this step. Now, the next thing is merge these together and compare and check for dupes. And, you know, so yeah, it was just running constantly, but, um, but it did a great job with it. So I'll put a link to power photos. I know we've talked about it a million times, but, uh, but it was the yeah. first time that I'd um, really relied on it, you know, to, to like get the job done. I'm glad I've never had a need to use it. Yeah. Well, it's great. Mm. It really, I highly recommend it. It's yeah. Like, well, especially yeah. since, you know, I dove into the, uh, you know, iCloud photo library, mm -hmm. uh, pond. Um, I'm thrilled. It's awesome. It does everything right. I would want. Well, that was the thing is I just needed to get them there and it was like, you know, right. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Hopefully they're happy. They're on vacation. I did send them a note saying, hey, uh, I'm going to do this iCloud merge, but if it starts messing with your devices because you're traveling or whatever, like, let me know. But it shouldn't. So given how I have them all set up. So, anyway, there you go. It's fun. Yes. As Brian Monroe says, yeah. dealing with people's digital clutter can simply take time. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, cool. you should uh, extend the tip jar. Maybe get a tip. That's right. There you go. Giving such good advice. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> they yeah. paid me well for my time. It's fine. 
Um, all right. Uh, should we go to Andrew here? Where are we? Let's answer. Let's answer Andrew's question oh, here. That's another one where yeah, there's there's some uh, backroom chatter that okay. we had in this as well. You you answer the question that I answered. Uh, okay. Uh, you'll lead it off, and I will bring up. Uh, I'll bring up the email where I replied as well, because I think there are multiple answers to cool. this question. None of them right or wrong. Yeah, I, well, well man, that's yeah, who knows. That's the thing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask. I'll I'll pose Andrew's question, but I think you have the right answer. He says I've got a 13 inch MacBook Air purchased in 2017, uh, which was inadvertently upgraded to uh, 10.13.x up from 10.12. I can downgrade and reinstall the older Mac OS after erasing the internal flash drive, but I have not been able to restore the recovery partition back to the lower recovery partition version of 10.12.x. Any guidance on how to roll it back is greatly appreciated. So my first thought, I have not done this, but my first thought was if you're going to if you go and boot from something else, not the recovery partition cuz recovery partition can't delete itself, but if you go boot from something else, and truly repartition the drive. Don't just erase the the you know the the volume that's there. But if you repartition the drive, I thought that that would get rid of the recovery partition, and then therefore, when Matt, you're reinstalling Mac OS and putting you know ten dot twelve back on there, that that would do it. But well, sometimes that doesn't. Or the, I'm pretty sure that's what Apple claims. Should that's what happen. I thought. Okay. If All you right. reinstall the OS, especially on a erased drive, it should wipe out and upgrade the uh, or build. Recovery. But it yeah, sounds like it didn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it didn't for him. That's right. Yeah. So you found another way, John. So short of wiping the drive, which he did, and that didn't work. Um. So I found a few other things, Dave. That were uh, pretty interesting. So, so I want to, I want to go into yours, but I do want to make sure because it's possible that Andrew did not actually wipe the drive. Right when you're in disk utility, um, you can, and I mentioned this, but I I don't want to gloss over it. When you're in disk utility, you can choose the drive or the volume inside the drive, uh, right? And if you choose the volume and erase that then that does not touch the recovery partition that's there. It's just like the volume, except that it's hidden in disk utility, so you can't see it. But if you go up and choose the drive and choose to repartition it, take the partitions that are there off, put new ones out there, that should wipe the the drive, especially if you repartition and just tell it one partition. That should do it. So, right. so, so my guess is he just erased the volume, not the drive. It, but right yeah which so, is yeah because there are different levels correct and you can erase at different levels okay so he may not have done a full erase which, right okay I'm, I'm with you on that yeah yeah the repartition um, is the key yeah but the question i had is what i think he was saying is that when he went into recovery so, so how how did he determine that recovery was not the right recovery is that i assume that when he ran recovery and then he said reinstall mac os it said well hey you want me to install the latest version i think that's what he was saying do, do, do you agree with me on that no he um he put 10.12 on there but his recovery partition was still the one from 10.13 right well i i think that's just what i said oh okay <laughs> is how did he know recovery was the wrong version and the only way i can tell that recovery is the wrong version is that when you try to say reinstall Mac OS, it, 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 it says to install a version. That's not the version. When you try to say that from within the recovery partition, right? Yes. yes. Or just go to, that's the what Apple, I think he was saying just go to the Apple menu and choose about this Mac. And it'll show you on the recovery partition that you're running high Sierra, not Sierra. Uh, I found it doesn't do that. It, it won't just tell says, you. Huh. No, it's, it's uh, no, it's kind of an obscure, the, the menu, from what I could see, didn't indicate the version of OS that it thought it was running. It's just like, oh, I'm running recovery or, okay. or disutility or something like that. So huh. I think, yeah, so one, I, to clarify, I think that's how he determined that the OS on the recovery was different from the OS that he had installed. But a couple of other tips, um, 
carbon copy cloner, uh, which is my favorite, Dave, and I think is it, yours as well. Um, carbon copy cloner is really good about recovery partition backing up and restoring. Last I checked, and that it points it out. So one suggestion would be, hey, if you have an old backup uh, made with carbon copy cloner, restore from that, and that may fix it. Yeah. And then yeah, it won't create one, a recovery partition, but it will let you back up and restore them. That's right. Right. So if he has a backup where it, it backed up the recovery partition, it would restore it to the new drive. So uh, yep. if he still, if he has a fairly recent backup that he's confident uh, that he's sure about, then use that. The other thing is then I did some uh, Google foo and surfing. And the other thought, Dave, though, though it's kind of risky, um, but you could, I mean, I kind of like this one because it's kind of, you know, living on the edge here, but um, you could delete the recovery partition. And and I did find an article that tells you how to do this. So it's actually, you got to dig into the terminal um, and basically say, okay, delete the recovery partition, which you should be able to say if you, uh, you can run disutil from the terminal and uh, see which one it is, and yep. you can erase it, and then merge it into, uh, it, it doesn't take up a lot of space, but then uh, I found an article that said both how to delete it, and then how to merge it once you've deleted it into your main partition, and then you could try to reinstall the OS. And that might and create a new one, right? And then it'd be like, oh, there's no recovery partition. Um, so, yeah, I believe that. A couple of additional vectors yeah. that you may want to explore here. But, cool. Um, we All right, we've got time for a few. We actually have some quick tips here that, that are intentional quick tips, uh, believe it or not, not just like croutons <laughs> that you find. Um, so the first is from Russell, who says, in the last few episodes, you, you have been skirting around, but you haven't said it. There is a command uh, that when invoked properly in the finder empties the trash with no other confirmation or interaction. He says, it's what I use every time, but it's a dangerous keyboard shortcut. So be careful and try not to get caught. That is command option, shift, delete command option, shift, delete deletes, empties everything in the trash. Doesn't ask you, doesn't pass. Go whatever's there is gone. So there you go. Be careful. With great power comes great responsibility, but you know, that's okay. Well, it's four keys, so it's, uh, it's, it's hard to yeah, stumble. Right, but you know, still be careful. All right, uh, so that's the first of the quick tips. Uh, the second is from Patrick, who uh, says that you can modify the home screen layout of, an, of your iPhone or your iPad with Apple Configurator 2. And it's great, actually. Um, I I took a screenshot of this. It, it's you, you see all of your uh, different screens at once. You can dig into folders and you can move things around very quickly, which is the key. And then you just hit apply and it pushes the changes over to your phone. Um, it's action. It, if you launch Apple Configurator 2, it's in actions, modify, home screen layout. So this is really cool because that's, that's often a pain in the neck. So there you go. Oh yeah. yeah. I think we mentioned it in the past, but um, yeah. Yeah. So Apple configurator two gives back what iTunes took away in a better way. I think too, because iTunes would do it on the fly. So this, you do everything and then you hit apply and you're done. So, so thank Plus, you. Patrick. The configurator does a ton of additional cool stuff. Well, there's that. Uh, yeah. We're going to talk about. Right. But there you go. And then, um, and then David uh, links us to a quick tip at how to geek that shows how to move multiple apps at once. And the way it works is you get your home screen into jiggly, jiggly mode. You know, uh, you hold down until it starts doing that. And then you tap and drag one icon to start it moving uh, around the screen. To add another app, you use a different finger and tap its icon while you're holding down the first and boom, they'll start to stack together. And we've talked about this before, but every time somebody brings it up, I'm just blown away um, because I forget about it for some reason. I don't know why, but there you go. So, um, so yeah, you just get it into jiggly mode, start moving one app 
And before you let that go, just use your, another finger to tap on other apps and they'll all pile on and then you can drag them all together. So two different ways to, wow. yeah, I thought so. Pretty good, right? That's what I got, John. And really, I think that's going to, uh, that's going to bring us to the outro today. Can yeah. Wrap it up. It's time. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Alex, wait, wait, wait. There might be a bonus quick tip here. Alex says, did you know that with the magic mouse, you can move an item and with another finger, you can swipe? I had no idea. Wow. And he says that way you're uh, dragging and dropping. Man, that's pretty cool. Well, you had no idea, Dave, but I'm going to give you an idea. All right. And that's if you have a question or comment or tip or cookies or brownies or snacks. Croutons. You should send them or <laughs> you, you are fixated on those croutons. I'm obsessed. Um, you, you should. If you're obsessed with croutons, you should send an email to feedback at MacGeekab.com. I think you said feedback at MacGeekab.com. You are absolutely correct in that I'm going to send you some croutons to feedback at MacGeekab. No, I think if you're going to send croutons, you send those to feedbag at (laughs) MacGeekab.com. I'm just saying. There you go. Uh, You can also, as I mentioned before, premium members can email us at premium at MacGeekab.com. We do have a phone number. In fact, we've got quite a few voicemails that uh, I think we're going to be including at least some of them in the next episode. You can call us at 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is 433 Five? Yeah, and do you hmm. see the commas when I every week when I say which John is? Because I do. I see them in front of me. It's it's beautiful. What? In fact, what are you talking about? Well, grammatically, you know, that's all. Uh, and you can also find us on Facebook. Go to macgeekup.com slash Facebook. That'll bring you there. And uh, and it's a beautiful thing, which is what I like. We and like lastly, beautiful things. You yes. haven't mentioned this for a while, but hey, you know, go to iTunes. Look us up. Oh, Give actually, you don't have to. Go to MacGeekGub.com slash iTunes. That'll bring you to where you can ah. uh, review us. Yeah. Yeah. But reviews are great. Reviews Shake are great. Shake your fist. Um, shower us with praise or something in between. That's right. All right. Well, I want to thank, of course, all of you for listening, all of you for contributing, uh, all the folks in the chat room for helping us out during the show. And uh, I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth. Of course, I want to thank all of our sponsors. As we said in this episode, we have Smile at TextExpander.com slash podcast. We have Barebones Software at Barebones.com. We have Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. We've got RoboForm at RoboForm.com. Two new ones coming in the next episode. Well, I think that's it, John. Do you have uh, Do you have any advice to give him? I think I do. Yeah, it's it's swirling in the back of my mind here. But but I think uh, the thing is, especially with all this terrible weather that we're having in the Northeast and throughout the country here, you want to make sure you stay home. You stay yeah, <laughs> stay safe and don't get caught. Made up. Back.